Colorado's Republican Senator Cory Gardner is breaking with President Trump on the government shutdown. Gardner wants the government to reopen without funding for President Trump's border wall. This is a helpful headline for Gardner as he faces a tough re-election, but he told me today that he hasn't actually discussed his stance with other Republicans, and it's not clear if he has the clout to convince them to end the shutdown. Well, to be clear, I support border security funding. That was in the legislation that passed uh, the Senate last Congress. It's, I believe, in the continuing resolution that Nancy Pelosi is going to be proposing or has proposed. Uh, and I've supported, uh, along with Democrats and Republicans, $25 billion for border security. And I think if you look at where the Democrats were just seven, eight months ago, they supported $25 billion in funding for border security. The real question is why the change right now? I hope that we can continue to fight for additional border security dollars. That's what we need to do. Uh, but I don't think shutting down the government's the right way to do it. We have recently seen a number of your priorities from marijuana banking reforms to the public lands bill blocked by fellow Republicans. What makes you think that you'll have any kind of pull or traction with them this time? The marijuana initiative, I think we've got uh, continued support from the president to get this done. I think that's something no other Republican has been able to do. And I also think when it comes to the public lands measures, we've been guaranteed a vote uh, coming up at the beginning of this Congress. So I'm excited about these initiatives and look forward to their successful passage. Our full interview with Senator Gardner is posted on the next Facebook page. There I ask him whether he thinks that the president's wall, the actual physical wall, is the right strategy. I've been curious what the government shutdown means for the Denver Federal Center, because my daily travels don't take me past that complex off of 6th Avenue. So is it a ghost town or, or business as usual? Our Steve Steger found a federal employee who is still working, and the guy offered him a tour. If there ever was a place to see evidence of a government shutdown, it's here. It says so right in the name. The Denver Federal Center has about 28 different agencies here employing about 6,000 different uh, workers. Rich Stebbins uh, is a GSA. federal employee. He's the local spokesman for the General Services Administration. During this lapse in government funding, the buildings are still open. GSA is responsible for keeping all these buildings up and running. We still have the majority of our folks that are still working. So his building is full. You could tell it from the parking lot. Travel around a little bit and you'll see this place certainly isn't a ghost town. There are people walking around. Employees at the Bureau of Reclamation are here because Congress already approved their budget. It's not a total shutdown, so we're keeping everything wide open for those folks that are coming to work here. They're even keeping this building open, the Bureau of Land Management, even though the agency is part of the shutdown and the parking lot is practically empty. Perhaps the best visual example of the partial government shutdown is the parking lot of the USGS Ice Core Labs. The government is partially shut down and the parking lot is partially full. Because there is limited staffing around, it is a little bit quieter. Bottom line, the Denver Federal Center certainly isn't bustling. It probably just looks like your office does the weeks around a holiday. And hey, just because the agencies managing wildlife are closed, it doesn't mean wildlife isn't doing its thing, like this bird of prey in the Federal Center parking lot. Perhaps it's a metaphor. Too bad it wasn't a bald eagle. Extra points if you can tweet me and tell me what kind of bird that was. Now, if you were watching last night, you remember folks were asking about federal contact contractors and what happens to them during a shutdown. Kyle, I talked to a few of them today who, mm -hmm. who emailed us last night who say they're not going to get paid back pay for the time that they're off. They yeah. had to file for unemployment benefits. And so uh, we tried to talk to some of them today. It just was kind of difficult. And none of them really wanted to talk to a camera and tell them that story because they're afraid of losing their job. That's understandable. That's absolutely understandable. Hey, good to have you back around these parts. Good to be back. We are getting some feedback tonight from a viewer named Tony Goss who thinks that we got it wrong last night. So we called out Democratic Senator Michael Bennett for starting a misleading claim about the impact of the national park shutdowns in Colorado, a claim that has now gone viral. Bennett tweeted that Colorado's economy was losing $1.9 million a day because of the park's closure. His team admitted to us they just divided the annual visitor spending due to park visitorship by 365 days. They ignored the obvious that our national parks are packed in the summer and the fall and they're largely empty this time of year. Tony emailed me to say that we failed to consider the losses in places like Estes Park, the shopping and the hotels and the tours and et cetera. So actually, Tony, I went back and looked at this again. The inflated number that was used by Senator Bennett's team, that comes from the National Park Service's estimate for all visitor spending at the park, near the park, all the ancillary spending. 
And we understand dollars, no matter the amount, Estes Park would like to see those again and soon. A congressman from Colorado kept his word on his first day in Congress today. Democrat Jason Crow of Aurora did not vote for Nancy Pelosi for speaker. Crow voted for Senator Tammy Duckworth. It's a reminder that while every speaker in American history has come out of the House, there's nothing in the Constitution that says the speaker must serve there. Another Colorado Democrat who had pledged to oppose Nancy Pelosi flipped as expected. Congressman Ed Perlmutter had cut a deal to guarantee Pelosi the votes that she needed to be speaker. In return, Perlmutter got a promise that Pelosi won't serve more than four more years. At that point, though, Pelosi would be 82 years old, four years older than the oldest House Speaker in history. So who knows if she's going to run in 2023, or even if Democrats would still hold the House at that point. The deal with Perlmutter lets him claim that he got something in return for going back on his pledge to oppose Pelosi. And Speaker Pelosi is a master of these deals. That's how she got where she is today. There is no shame in being dunked on by the LeBron James of modern politics, but suggesting that getting dunked on was your strategy might be a stretch. Hicks packing up his governor's office so he can hit the presidential campaign trail after his days in office here. He's visiting Iowa and New Hampshire in the next two months. Now, a president, Hickenlooper, would have a say in a government shutdown. Governor Hickenlooper inserted himself, along with the state's money, in a pretty unusual way during the last shutdown. Our Marshal Zellinger asked him today, why not do it this time? In September 2013, Rocky Mountain National Park had to close because of historic flooding. One month later, it closed again because of a federal government shutdown. Colorado paid the federal government $362,000 to reopen it. Yeah, in 2013, we just had the massive flood. Uh, Estes Park was closed down by the flood, and right when they reopened, and it was when the leaves were turning color, right, right at that moment, all of a sudden there was a shutdown. It would have decimated the economy of Estes Park. Uh, luckily, we're not at that point. Governor John Hickenlooper is not ready to make the same offer yet. When the leaves are changing in Estes Park uh, and in Rocky Mountain National Park, that's part of the best sales system or sales period for all those small businesses. Uh, I think now after the holidays with a shutdown, uh, it's not as dire, but still. Seriously, these are people's lives, right? But if you only saw Senator Michael Bennett's tweet, you'd think the national park shutdown was dire, costing $1.9 million a day. A dollar amount Bennett's office admits is not that high. Even if it's only $100,000 a week, that's real money, right? That's, that's the difference in a small business between success and failure. So where did the state have that money to pay in 2013? It actually came from the Colorado Tourism Office. The state requested reimbursement after the fact, but in a statement from the Tourism Office, I was told it wasn't a stipulation of the money and there was no expectation of reimbursement. Fancy words for we never got our money back, Kyle. Hey, can you cover lunch today? There's no expectation of reimbursement. I need to borrow some money, by the way. Yeah, exactly. All right, thank you, Marshall. So Denver will not be adding any more red light cameras at intersections across the city, at least not for now. Instead, city engineers and the police are going to test whether making yellow lights longer might also improve safety. City Council rejected a contract this week to expand the red light camera system. One problem with this contract, it listed the wrong intersections. Councilman Kevin Flynn convinced the city that they should reevaluate yellow light timing first. Flynn says he went out and tested this himself and found that at two of the three intersections where they were going to stick the cameras, 13th and Lincoln and 18th and Lincoln, Flynn says the yellow lights there were shorter than they should be according to the city's own standard. Denver historically for decades used the legal three second uh, minimum yeah, uh, yellow time, whether you were on a little side street in a neighborhood approaching a little light in the middle of a neighborhood or out on Colorado Boulevard where people are going 40 or 45 miles an hour. The laws of physics will always trump the laws of traffic. So you have to engineer for each intersection. Like that dude on the left was like a little visual reminder of what yellow looks like. This could take up to nine months for engineers to complete their study. If at that point they decide they still want to go with the red light cameras, Councilman Flynn told us, well, you know, at that point they can tell citizens, hey, at least we tried. We shared a bit of a laugh right here last night about Longmont's time traveling New Year's baby. The local newspaper's proclamation of the first baby of 2109. Whoops. Hey, it's a reminder that all of us in this business make mistakes publicly, some more prominent and more humorous than others. But then I heard from an ex-viewer named Kent Muller. He's a Longmont native, 
He's a Lutheran minister and also full disclosure, Kent says his daughter works at the place that puts out the paper, but it wasn't her typo. Anyway, I invited Kent on next for his own commentary, which is way more thoughtful than anything I had to say. I wonder what kind of world the first baby of 2109 will be born into. It's humbling to realize that nearly everyone watching won't be walking this earth 90 years from now. Hopefully, Taylor Birch, born in Longmont on New Year's Day, will be 90 years old and make a big deal of the newspaper headline when that year rolls around. Meanwhile, as our government reorganizes for 2019, we need to make decisions for the benefit not of ourselves, but on behalf of the first baby born in 2109. I mean, this man was like my father, uh, a father figure to me. We might not all know his name. His story and his congressional gold medal suggest that we should. He was my hero, and he was why I joined the Marine Corps, and so it was, uh, it was tough. It towers five stories over a busy street and it's coming down. It's just a really good example of uh, a type of architecture that doesn't really exist too much in Denver. They did try to save this thing. That's next. People are outside. People are active in this state. And I think uh, by osmosis, people like sports, people like athletics. Nothing bonds a community like the sports team. And when you go around the country like I do with sports, when you're on a plane and you tell them you're from Denver, there's a lot of pride. You understand how special the Denver market is. Even in the bad times, this is a great sports market. It's just a cool place to be. Of all the comforts we provide at Plumline Services, the most important one is trust. And we do whatever it takes to earn it. Save up to $2,000 on a carrier heating and cooling system. Turn to the experts you trust at Plumline Services. Latina for me means family. It means being part of a community where you're never alone. Being Latina is being strong and independent. Being Latino is, is really everything to me. It's who I am. Being Latina means celebrating life in a unique way. Next is a conversation about what's happening in Colorado. Your views and mine. We can be honest, real. What's on your mind? Get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. With our laser measured floor liners, no drill mud flaps, cargo liner, a bump step, and even seat protectors. WeatherTech has everything you need to keep winter out of your vehicle. Order today at weathertech.com. Made right in America. a chilly snowy start to the new year things are starting to warm up around here how about 60 degrees on tap tomorrow yeah it's going to be just gorgeous we have stormy skies out to the northwest and also to the southeast into parts of texas and oklahoma where they're dealing with snow none of that around here it actually looks relatively mild tonight we're down to 25 mostly clear those higher mountain valleys though gunnison alamosa i'm looking at you you're going sub-zero but not quite as chilly as early this morning high pressure sets up across the state this is going to bring us all that sunshine and the heat too. We're talking 60 degrees on tap tomorrow with all that sunshine, light winds around 50s across the eastern plains with some 40s up in the mountains. A nice little warm up on the way for you folks too. 62 on Saturday, loads of sunshine, all that snow that fell. Oh, it will be long gone. We do have another storm system though that moves in on Sunday. That'll bring some snow to the high country, maybe a few flurries late Sunday night into early Monday morning. A little cool off, lower 50s, and then look at that, Kyle, back to the 60s in no time. Oh, wait, we go. Danielle Grant, thank you. I know. <laughs> Tonight, we pause to honor a man who is not a household name in our state. Those who did know him say that he changed the course of their lives. Sergeant Major Archie Robinson passed away the day before Christmas Eve. He was 89. He started serving in the U.S. Marine Corps when it was still segregated. Later, he would be awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. That's America's highest civilian honor. People who knew him for more than three decades Help us remember his legacy. Those values of honor, courage, and commitment 
weren't just words to him. I mean, he lived them for 30 plus years in the Marine Corps. My name is uh, Colonel Scott Stebbins, and I am here today to talk to you about my teacher, my mentor, my hero, uh, Sergeant Major Archie Robinson. Uh, the first time I met Sergeant Major Robinson was in high school, my sophomore year, 1983. I mean, this man was like my father, uh, a father figure to me. Uh, he was the reason I joined the Marine Corps. I think from 1942 to 1949, the Marine Corps was segregated. Uh, so black Marines went to Montford Point and white Marines went uh, to uh, Paris Island. I mean, he endured you know, a lot of racism, a lot of segregation. He didn't get all the good jobs, or he was a, a steward in a wardroom aboard a ship, you know, serving, for, serving officers. But that's not what he wanted to do. That's not why he joined the Marine Corps. He wanted to fight. He would purposely uh, screw up, uh, pour coffee on officers just to get out of being a cook or out of a steward so that they would ship him off, you know, to the front lines. And he fought in Korea, 1953, with Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, and then he was also uh, in Vietnam uh, from 1968 to 1969. So he retired from the Marine Corps after 30 years of service, and then he still wanted to be a Marine. And so he became a assistant military instructor at uh, Adams City High School in Commerce City. He would take these uh, at-risk kids and teach them about history and about uh, um, leadership and about being a good citizen. He taught us uh, we're all Marines. It doesn't matter what your race, color, creed, religion, or whatever, you're a Marine first. Anyone who wants to pay their respects to Sergeant Major Robinson is welcome at the memorial service tomorrow at Harvey Park Church. And afterward, he'll be buried with full military honors at Fort Logan. That's at 2.15 in the afternoon. Denver is losing a very recognizable piece of the city. Just because a building is lost doesn't mean it didn't have significance. The bridge to the future will soon be the past. And what happens when the people who put up the signs don't bother to read the signs? Next. Listen up, pizza. You might only be $5 on Fridays, but you've got all the makings of a champion. Now let's eat this thing! Sports! What? For $5 on Fridays, get a large sausage, cheese, or pepperoni fence. We make it, you bake it. Papa Murphy's. The whole idea of Next is that we want you to hear things and say, right on, that's what I'm thinking. And we also want you to hear things that make you squirm a little bit, make you uncomfortable, perspectives that you might not have considered, but are still thoughtful. And it's okay if you hear things that you don't like, because you're smart enough to decide whether or not you agree with it. Let's consider different perspectives. Let's give you good information so that you can make smart choices. You should expect to see and hear things that you have not seen and heard anywhere else. People are outside. People are active in this state. And I think uh, by osmosis, people like sports. People like athletics. Nothing bonds a community like the sports team. And when you go around the country like I do with sports, when you're on a plane and you tell them you're from Denver, there's a lot of pride. You understand how special the Denver market is. Even in the bad times, this is a great sports market. It's just a cool place to be. Latina for me means family. Being Latino to me means having pride in my heritage. It means being part of a community where you're never alone. Being Latina is being strong and independent. Being Latino is, is really everything to me. It's who I am. Being Latina to me means that I can achieve whatever I want. What Latina means to me is being bold. It's being creative, innovative, resourceful. Being Latina means celebrating life in a unique way kind of just on the cusp of making it to that next level. So I just got to stay ready at all times. Because you can play football, you can play basketball, you can play tennis, but you can't play fight. He looks beat up, and I'm so concerned about his well-being that I don't sleep. Got five stitches in my eyebrow. This is what Josh wants to do. This is what makes him happy. Well, I just support him. I pray that when this is all said and done, that his mind and his body are OK to have a normal life.
For tonight's What Do You Say? We return to the mess of city streets that cause mass confusion on our lips. They're west of Broadway, and one after another is named after a native tribe, yet a lot of them are not pronounced the same way. That is the case for this one that starts with the letter U. So we asked our expert, Dr. Colorado, history professor at CU Denver, what do you say? Umatilla is the way I've heard it. A branch of the uh, Indians living on the Umatilla River uh, near the Columbia River in Oregon. The name refers to a tribal village where there were many rocks. I bet Spanish-speaking people would pronounce it Umatilla. All right, that is one that I have mangled over the years. You heard Dr. Tom Noel say, say Umatilla. I know I've said Umatilla over the years, and obviously he points out that other people linguistically correct would say Umatilla. Huh, that's interesting. Another example of Denverites going this way and that on pronunciations. What other place names trip you up? Or maybe we could settle a bet with somebody in your household or at work who says it differently than you do. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention anytime with the hashtag HeyNext. It is a sign that perhaps the people putting up the signs don't always read the signs. Next viewer named David saw this. Please help protect park trees. Do not attach items to trees. David noted the sign itself is attached to a tree at Mayfair Park. This was on Christmas Eve. That's pretty good. Send us the signs that make you smile. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. An iconic building in Denver that for decades has served as a pedestrian bridge over 9th Avenue is being demolished. Developers say they could not come up with an affordable way to salvage the so-called bridge to the future. Before it becomes the past, we asked a historian to talk about its significance. We're watching, sadly, the demolition of a great architectural building here in Denver. This old bridge building is a good example of mid-century modern architecture. It makes me feel sad, actually, that they're tearing down something like this. I'm Annie Levinsky. I'm the executive director of Historic Denver, a local nonprofit advocacy group. We're sitting underneath the part of the old hospital building at 9th in Colorado. You know, buildings tend to be at their greatest risk when they're between 30 and 50 years old. This building is just slightly older than that. It's a great example of modernist design from the 60s, I would guess. It was designed in 1964 by an architecture firm out of Chicago. Uh, and one of the things that's most unique about it are the louvered panels that were placed all across the outside. And it's nice, clean lines, the way it spans across the street. So this is certainly reflective of Denver's post-war boom when the medical campus and the hospital were growing uh, enormously after World War II. I would have liked to have seen it kept. You know, I do empathize with people who are saddened by this demolition. Uh, we're seeing a lot of change in our city and buildings like this help anchor us. And this building certainly has merit for its architecture and also for the story it helps tell about how our city grew and developed and expanded our healthcare industry, which of course today is one of our major activities in Denver. That massive redevelopment of 9th in Colorado is expected to include some apartments, condos, townhomes, movie theater, restaurants, and shops. All these people, you know what that's likely to do to traffic on an already packed Colorado Boulevard. As an old co-worker of my wife used to say, and I love to repeat, Colorado Boulevard is never the answer. Speaking of answers, a ton of you wrote in with an answer to Steve Stager's question tonight. And a woman in the audience suggests that perhaps my gender had something to do with my language tonight. We'll discuss next. What if you could sail into a world where anything's possible? What if every day brought something new? What if a ship could transport you in more ways than one? With Celebrity Cruises, there are no ifs. For a limited time, book during our Sail Beyond event to receive our biggest offer of the year. Click or call to book today. I'm Corey Rose, sharing Colorado stories, nine news everywhere. Who 
pool together all your money with a friend and invest in two Arby's French Dip and Swiss sandwiches for just six dollars. It's the perfect get rich quick on sandwiches scenario. Arby's, we have the meat. An accident can happen anytime, and the injuries can last a lifetime. That's why we're open right now and on holidays, nights, and weekends. Call us because justice never sleeps. Bacchus and Shanker, our passion is justice. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking, Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes, Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You, you want to be where everybody knows your name. Innovate Pace, all-inclusive care to help seniors stay independent and in their own homes. Latina for me means family. Being Latino to me means having pride in my heritage. It means being part of a community where you're never alone. Being Latina is being strong and independent. Being Latino is, is really everything to me. It's who I am. Being Latina to me means that I can achieve whatever I want. What Latina means to me is being bold. It's being creative, innovative, resourceful. Being Latina means celebrating life in a unique way. Okay, so there's a touch of disagreement about what exactly is the bird of prey at the Federal Center that Steve Steger had in his piece. He wanted you to identify it. Most popular pick, a Cooper's hawk. Craig and KJ and others suggested that. Bentley thought it was a, a marsh hawk. And, well, we got a few more guesses that I'm pretty sure are wrong. I'm thinking Cooper's hawk. Hey, great email tonight from Deb in Denver who writes, Is it possible to adjust language, imagery, metaphors, etc. when discussing the accomplishments of women? She says, I was struck tonight by Kyle's reference to Nancy Pelosi as the LeBron James of political maneuvering. Might have been more fitting to call her the Serena. Deb, I like that. It means I have to change up the end of the commentary, though. So I will say, there is no shame in getting aced by the Serena Williams of modern politics. But for Congressman Ed Perlmutter to pretend that getting aced was his strategy is a stretch. Thank you, Deb. That is better. We'll see you next time.